We come to Revelation chapter 9 in our study of that book. The Apostle John has been writing to us about the visions that he has seen. The, you could say the vision, but in some ways we've seen that they're divided up a little bit. So this is a little bit of a resting place between. But uh, he's been writing to us about these, and uh, they're about the ongoing work of Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus is reigning at the right hand of the Father, the majesty on high as our mediator, and he's going about his plan to establish his righteous kingdom in the world. And we get to see what that looks like from heaven's perspective. And we're not seeing a visual of heaven. It's not that there's really these images, these things in heaven that are going on like that, but it's showing us the things that are being done through visual imagery, through signs. So it's very helpful for us. By reading this book, we're able to gain an understanding then of how Jesus works since he went up there and how he works today. So it gives us a, an idea that we can apply. There are various views of Revelation and how it ought to be interpreted. The partial preterist view holds that Revelation was written before the fall of Jerusalem and so is focused on the fulfillment of uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem from the period in the period um, AD 66 to AD 70. I believe that's the view that has the most to commend it. But uh, those who hold to this view preach from it or ought to preach from it in the same way that we preach from other scriptures, where we read something about maybe there's a prophecy in the Old Testament in Isaiah or something, and uh, prophets say certain things are going to happen, and this is why they're happening because God is sending them. And then they happen, and uh, so we will preach about that, that this is what was prophesied, this is how it was fulfilled. And then uh, in preaching, we'll talk about how it applies to us, because we learned about God, we learned about how He works, and we're not saying this same event that was prophesied is going to happen according to that prophecy, but we're saying this is how God works with nations and people, how He works with His people, how He deals with them, so we can expect Him to work in a similar way with us today. And we begin to, to um, apply the scriptures, you see, to our situation. And of course, it, the, the different views can uh, lend themselves to that, like the historicist view, where you have things happening in kind of a linear fashion, going through a longer period of time. Like preterists see it in a linear fashion in the pre-70 AD, and then the things, of course, that come after that that are, are mentioned later on, like the uh, kingdom and everything. And then the, um, the historicist view sees it like stretched out. So it's linear again, but it's going on different periods of history, get into the 600s and then uh, moving on to the Reformation, and they see those things set forth in the Scripture. And then there's the futurists that look to see a fulfillment that's ahead of us yet, mostly. And uh, all these views, if they take the Scriptures and apply them to the people today and how these things relate to us, then they can be edifying and helpful to us as Christians. Today we're going to see what happens in the world when Satan and his demons are turned loose upon a people. I'm calling it a deluge, a flood of demons. Matthew Henry commenting on the five-month time frame of this deluge of demons suggested that gospel sermon seasons have their limit, limited time period, and times of seduction are limited too. Okay, so in other words, he's saying sometimes there's a period where there's an outpouring of this kind of um, demonic kind of influence and activity. Other times the gospel is poured out in a very special way, and there's limits. It can be a three-year period, it can be a six-month period, it can be you know, all, all different times, but that's how God works. And I would point out as well that sometimes they come at the same time. In other words, there can be an outpouring of demonic uh, matter things, in influences, and gospel at the same time, such as when the Lord Jesus Christ came and when his apostles went forth to minister. You had both happening uh, at the same time. So this is, the, this is the kind of thing, though, that we're looking at here. Um, as we go to our reading now, the first half of chapter 9, 
let me remind you of the flow of the book of Revelation where we are right now. In chapter 8, we learned of the first four trumpet judgments. And um, the chapter concluded with a, re- a warning that there were three more trumpet judgments that were going to be worse than those first four. And we were told that um, the, of a th- there was a threefold woe pronounced. Woe, woe, woe uh, for each of those judgments. And so this is the first woe, the fifth trumpet judgment, and the first woe. Today we'll look only at the fifth one as it's described in chapter or, or verses 9 through 12. So here is God's holy and marvelous word, Revelation 9, verses 1 through 12. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power." They were commanded not to harm the grass or of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and their stings were in their tails. And there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. May God help us to understand and apply these words as we consider them now. Here we have Satan and his demons set loose to torment people. Satan seems to be the one that is described here. You can see that the star falls and it said, and then he did this and he did that. So it's a star with personality. <laughs> um, it's, uh, the star is used as a symbol of it as, it is, as we've seen a lot in Revelation. So verse 1 refers to him, in fact, as a star fallen from heaven. So last week I explained that stars represent spiritual leaders, very often angels. When Jesus' disciples returned from their first ministry excursion, do you remember what Jesus said? They boasted that even the demons are subject to us. And in response to that, Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So because the disciples were casting out demons, it showed the fall of Satan from his place. The the one described here in verse 1 is described as a star that had already fallen. Okay, when he sees it, a star that had already fallen, a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To fall suggests the loss of status, power, or privilege. It doesn't suggest coming down deliberately, but a fall. Satan had long enjoyed his status as the God of this world, but when Jesus came, his dominion was taken from him so that the gospel could spread beyond Israel to the nations where Satan had had more of a free reign. Never an entirely free reign. He always restrained. But he had worked his work among the nations and they were deceived. And now he was, able, he was restrained from that so that the nations could turn to the gospel. Satan is further pointed to in our text at verse 11 
where he's said to be the king over the angels who are shut up in the bottomless pit. In Revelation 12, 9, we're told that Satan has angels. Okay, so they're called his angels. Uh, they're, they're his in the sense that he is the one who led them into rebellion and the one who manages them in a sense now so that they were cast out with Satan when he was cast out. There was like a, a body of angels kind of thing you might say. In Revelation 12, 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see Satan and his angels. He's the king, the, the head of these angels. But the fact that he fell, and even that he was imprisoned or restrained, does not mean that he and his angels cannot cause trouble on the earth. Okay, he still can do much. The passage in Revelation 12 calls for rejoicing because Satan, the accuser, has been cast down. This is over, still talking about Revelation 12 right now. But then it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So, yes, he fell from his place that he had more dominion over the nations and so on, but woe to the earth. He's still able to do stuff here. He's even more angry now. So until Jesus returns, he will at times allow Satan liberty to wreak havoc upon the nations and peoples of the earth. That is what happens when he is cast out as he was in this vision of the fifth trumpet. So he's, been, he's fallen, he's cast out, and now here he comes. What, what, is, what, is, what do we see? Satan is given the key to open, open the bottomless pit, and all of these foul spirits are then released and given power to hurt people. Look at, um, look at verse 1 through 3 of our text. Revelation 9, 1 through 3. Then the fifth angel sounded. And I saw, John speaking, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. So these demons come out in great number like a flood, and they're depicted by locusts. And we see that these aren't really locusts like anybody's ever seen before when they're described later on. They, they're, um, again, these are symbols, and the symbol can even kind of change about it as, it as it's expressing different aspects. It's kind of like a, if you have a dream and things, things kind of can, can shift about. But these demons, the thing that is expressed here is they come out like a great flood. There's so many of them. It's a, a deluge of demons. This abyss or bottomless pit is referred to often in the Bible. Now, David Chilton points out that it is the place that is the farthest from heaven is how it's usually shown in the scripture. Okay, this abyss, this bottomless pit. It's often called the deep in the Old Testament, even as it is in the very opening of Genesis, where it, the creation account, it says that everything was not formed yet, it was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It is also the place where Jonah went in the belly of the fish when he said that he was down in the depths of the earth and he cried out to God and was heard from there. In the Exodus, the abyss is actually is how the Red Sea is referred to when Israel passed over the Egyptians when they tried to do so. It is also often referred to as the domain of the devil and the prison house of demons. So here, Chilton says, it is as if the abyss is being dredged up to cover the land of Israel with unclean spirits. 
So it's like this abyss is flooding over as the demons come out and flood over the land, the, the uh, land of God's people, the earth. The tabernacle of God is in heaven now. It's the, the temple at Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. God has left the temple and the, uh, it's, it's going to be brought to destruction. The tabernacle is now where Christ is, is our high priest. And so the worshipers come looking eyes up to heaven rather than eyes to Jerusalem. The foul spirits of the abyss are poured out then on the land where the temple had been. Or where it still is standing now um, as, this, as this vision occurs. In Matthew 12, 41 through 45, and this is really important to see here. Jesus prophesied that his generation would be flooded with unclean spirits. And I have to say that I not seen this so clearly in this passage until this week when I was studying these things. And it's remarkable what, when you look at the context of Matthew 12, 41 through 45. That includes the context that I'm referring to. You know, this is the, that's the passage you know where Jesus tells about if a guy has an unclean spirit and the spirit's cast out and then the spirit goes wandering about and then he comes back and he finds the place is swept and clean and he brings seven worse than himself and then uh, the, the situation is worse for the guy than it was to start with. But did you ever notice the context? Do you know what comes before that passage immediately? And you know what is the last statement in that passage? Well, let's look at it. It follows Jesus' pronouncement against the Jews for rejecting him. And he says that the judgment of the return of the demons with the seven who are worse is going to fall on this generation, the generation that rejected him. So this, this is very, very... Take a look at the passage itself. Matthew 12, 41 through 45. Jesus is talking to them and he says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment. Of course, that was a Gentile place where there's the Syrians, capital city, you know, the wicked Assyrians. He says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation, this generation, and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed are greater than Jonah is here. So these pagans that Nineveh, when Jonah preached in the name of the Lord, they repented. Now the Messiah, the Son of God, comes to Israel and they don't repent. So these guys are going to be judging you. And then verse 42, the Queen of the South, Queen of Sheba, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. She sought out that wisdom. And indeed, Jesus says, a greater than Solomon is here. Of course, he's talking about himself. Then he says immediately, still flowing along, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. But because, unlike Nineveh and the queen of Sheba, they rejected him, then the demons come back. And they don't just come back as they were. They come back with seven more that are greater than them when they find the house swept clean after Jesus has finished his ministry there. What we have then in Revelation 9 is a fulfillment of this prophecy. And I'll show more about this later. But do you see what is going on here? The place is swept clean. And then on this generation, this prophecy will be fulfilled of this uh, situation where a demon is cast out and seven more come. So look at how these wretched demons are described. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that first and then we'll look some more at the fulfillment of the prophecy. So what are, the, what is, what are these demons like when they're unleashed in this situation? The first point is a comforting one. We're told that they have no power but what the Lord gives them. They must follow His orders. We see that all the way through the Bible with demons and devils and everything. Did you notice that when the trumpet sounded, verse 1, 
the key to the bottomless pit was given to this star, if it be Satan. He's like a boy driving his dad's car. He can't take it out unless his dad lets him have the keys. And uh, he doesn't have authority, he doesn't have his own keys to go whenever he wants. So Satan cannot open the abyss to let the demons out unless the Lord gives him the key. He has to get permission. He has to get the keys from the Lord. Look at all the restrictions that are placed on Satan and his friends as they get those keys, as he gets those keys. First, they were limited in who and what they could attack. Revelation 9.4 They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They love to destroy whatever they can, but they are not allowed to attack nature at this time. Only men, only people. So that's an interesting restriction, isn't it? We saw that God was, had brought some judgments already that fell upon the earth, that seemed to fall upon nature, unless they were symbolic of other things, but they seem to. And here, they're not, not to do that. These are the demons in particular can't do that. But something that is very important it says that they cannot touch the ones who are sealed. Okay, now think back. Who are the ones that are sealed? The 144,000 Jews who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who had received the Messiah. Remember, we saw that they were sealed. And it was very clear that it was talking about the Jews. There were 12,000 from each of the tribes, so on. We said it's not like an exact number, but the idea is that... that these Jews that had believed, like the Hebrews that, were, um, that the book of Hebrews was written to, uh, they were sealed. That was what we saw when this, before the seventh seal was opened, right? That they would be protected from the, some of these judgments that were coming. So incidentally, this points to the fact that this refers to the judgment that fell on Jesus' generation in the first century because you have these 144,000 Jews here. So it points that that's what this is talking about. But as a believer, you need to know that while Satan can certainly tempt us, he, he and his demons cannot torment us the way they torment those who reject the Savior. We have the Spirit of God, and there is a sense in which the devil cannot touch us. Uh, in his first letter, John, who also wrote Revelation, said in 5.18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Okay, we better wait there a minute. Wait, what? Whoever is born of God doesn't sin? Don't, we, we still sin, don't we? What is John talking about? In John's epistle, he uses sin that way a lot of times to refer to apostasy. Someone that's really born again will not reject God and walk no more with him. That's what he means when he says they will not sin. They won't, they won't go out from him completely. So again, let's read the verse with that in mind. Okay, we know, John says, that whatever is born of God does not sin. Whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. And we need to respect that Satan is a roaring lion, and he can tempt us, and he goes about seeking whom he may devour, but he cannot destroy us. He cannot pull us away from Christ. He cannot pull us out of Christ. If you're a true believer, you're one of the ones who have the seal of God, as it were, like the 144,000 had the seal of God upon them. We are protected. And we, we hear stories. I was, uh, just saw some accounts recently about um, missionaries, you know, that had gone to a, a, a land and uh, the people there, the natives were not real happy to have the missionaries. So they said, why don't we direct them to set up their house over in the place where all the demons are, a place where nobody would ever go, and you know, see what happens. And so they sent the missionaries. There's a really nice track to land over here. <laughs> and so, so they went over, and uh, they just lived there. <laughs> Nothing happened. They, they, and the, 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 the natives were watching, and uh, like, when are they going to? have, you know, fire come down. When are they going to have, and, and they just, they just live there. <laughs> and uh, because they were believers, right? God was, God was with them. And that, that happens a lot of times in missionary stories. The missionary will, there'll be a place, of, oh, you, you don't go down that trail at night. If you go down that trail at night, they'll tell all the things that will happen. The missionaries will go walking down the trail at night. Everybody's, 
oh, what happened? So the, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that, that we're talking about here. Satan and his hosts were also not allowed to kill their victims in this case, even the ones that were their victims. Verse 5 says, and they were not given authority to kill them, but only to torment them. Never think then, never, ever, ever think that Satan can do whatever he wants. Some people have a false view that Satan's kind of equal with Christ. And they're kind of fighting with each other and one of them gets the upper hand and the other one gets the upper hand. It is not like that at all. God is over everything and Satan can't do anything unless permitted by God. He knows that and he deeply resents it and so do all who follow him. But he can't change that. That's the way it is. He was allowed to do things to Job, but very restricted. You can do this now, but you can't do this. Understand that when I say all who follow him with Satan, I, I include people too. Like I said, Satan and all who follow him resent it that they can't do whatever they want whenever they want. And it's the same way with uh, all, of, all of those who follow Satan. Until we are redeemed, we de deeply resent that we can't do whatever we want. One more restriction to note, Satan only has a set time. Or he referred to that with a comment from Matthew Henry. Five months to uh, torment these people. Whether it's an exact literal five months or not, we're not sure. Uh, it seems like reasonable that it might be. Uh, but he can never do as much as he wants. We're told that as verse 5 goes on, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them four or five months. So again, like to refer to Matthew Henry's comment again, God has seasons of these things. He doesn't just let go on all the time. He restricts it. Because if he did let it go on all the time, the world would be a completely intolerable place and it would overwhelm, you know, even us as believers. So the Lord has always been pleased to have seasons for this and seasons for that. Okay, uh, so having seen what this noxious host from the abyss is not permitted to do, look at what it is permitted and even instructed to do. They're appointed to torment relentlessly. Their torment is described as a sting like a scorpion. We can see the kind of things that they did to people when we read the Gospels. Okay, what kind of things did the people suffer from when they were afflicted by demons? In Israel, it was usually seizures and such things. Like the boy that would throw himself about, sometimes throw himself into the fire, things like that. Some of the worst cases that we read about in the Gospels were actually outside of Israel where God's people lived. Um, and some of the times God's people lived in these outside regions, but there was areas that were more Gentile regions. There was more restraint, in other words, among the Jews and, uh, as, there are, as there is among Christian nations. Like if you go to a holy pagan nation, there's more of this stuff that goes on. Sometimes a, a nation that's been very godly for a number of years, there'll be very little of this kind of thing. One of the worst cases outside of Israel was with the man Jesus encountered in the country of the Gadarenes. In Mark 5, 2 through 5, here's the kind of torment that we're talking about when they're allowed to torment. It says, and when he had come out of the boat, speaking of Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. He'd been driven out from society. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Pretty miserable, pretty difficult situation to be in. We can expect from Jesus' prophecy that when he said that in Jerusalem and Judea and the land of God's people, where there were demons, Jesus cast them out, but there was a restraint on, it was like the one demon, that when that demon returns with seven others, it's going to be like it was in the Gentile region, the Gadarenes. It's going to be like we read here. So we expect from Jesus' prophecy that when the seven were spirits returned to the swept house of Israel, it would involve demons like this. 
Now, these demons cannot actually kill people in this case. They're not allowed to do that. But they can torment them to the point that they want to die. And they can certainly incite them to kill others. Don't think there's a prohibition that way. They can't kill them themselves, but they can incite them to kill others. There was a lot of murder that went on, as we'll see shortly. The people as a whole would want to die under this miserable oppression, but would be kept alive. Now let's look at the attributes of these unclean spirits. First of all, they're presented as an unstoppable force as far as we're concerned. Of course, God can stop them. But uh, to describe their pervasiveness, they're represented in verse 3 as this great locust swarm. And we saw that in Joel too. There's a, like they're coming in and there's this everywhere. They're coming over, you know, they're, they're going over the walls and they're, they're in ranks and they just cover everything. I was in North Carolina when I was a boy and we had a, a, locust, uh, a locust invasion. And I remember, you know, you couldn't, you, you, you get out of your car and every step you crunch, 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 because they were just covering everything. And, you know, the trees were all covered, all the leaves were, were eaten off. It was just, uh, amazing to see uh, everything looked different because the locusts were were everywhere so the pervasiveness these demons are going to be poured out like I said before like a flood the abyss is going to come up and cover the land they were very fierce their sting as we just saw is like a scorpion they do these things that like what happened in uh, with with the uh, the gatherings and uh, is they're, they're like we're told that they have lion's teeth. So, you know, the fierceness of a lion. They're shown to be a mighty force in that their shape, verse 7, is like horses prepared for battle. Remember I told you these aren't ordinary locusts. This is a vision. So, so these, these guys are like, they're like horses prepared for battle. And they have breastplates of iron, it says in verse 9. So they're protected. They're, there's an invincibility. You can't harm them. Joel talked about how the locusts come by swords and everything and weapons and they just pass right on through and they aren't harmed. Interestingly, um, the sound of their wings is just like the sound of the holy angels when it's described. The angels that are around God's throne and such with their, their wings making a great clamor and, and noise like chariots and horses running into battle. Um, verse 9 it describes them like that. So they're mighty, mighty force. Remembering that this is a vision, then it's not necessary that uh, this is what necessarily what the victims would see. So it's not like the people that were being invaded by these demons. Demons are spiritual, so they probably didn't see anything. But there, there was, they, were, they were pervasive. They were everywhere. This is what John saw because he's seeing visions of spiritual things. They imitate God, but in a false and twisted way. They have a leader. But his name is Destroyer rather than Savior. So you see, they're kind of like God, a leader with his, over his people. But Destroyer is their master rather than Savior. They appear in a cloud. God appears in a cloud. But what kind of cloud? It's a cloud from the abyss instead of a cloud from glory. They have crowns like gold like gold. They don't have real authority. They have pretended, put on authority. They, they act as if they have great authority to do whatever they want, but they don't have that. The Lord Jesus has the real authority. They have faces like men, false appearance of humanity. Our Savior is a true man come in the flesh. They have hair like women, the appearance of beauty and feminine delicacy but they're fierce and hostile with stings in their tails. With these diabolical creatures flooding the land from the pit, it's understandable why, why this plague is singled out from the four that we saw earlier is a great woe. A thing that say, woe, this is the first woe. Let's consider the fulfillment then of this vision now. There is definitely something like this that happened to Israel in the first century. I can say that absolutely. We know that it did because of the prophecy that Jesus gave us that we read in Matthew 12. God's people had rejected him as their Messiah. 
He had swept their land free of demons. And Jesus himself said that the demons would return sevenfold. Seven, that were seven, worse than, seven demons even worse than the ones that had been there before. This was to happen, Jesus said, in his generation, the people that he was speaking to, that generation. It can be debated if Revelation 9 is specifically addressing that time. It could be another time, a later time. There's a debate about that. But it cannot be debated that something like this happened to that generation before the destruction of Jerusalem, the ones that rejected Jesus, because Jesus said so. We can also, I think it is this, but we, you, that's what we're saying, that it did happen. We can also look at the historical records that describe what it looked like for demons to flood the land and what it looked like in Israel. We're told of that during this time, you know, around 66, uh, AD 66, uh, there were three factions that Dr. Philip Kayser described as arising among the Jews that were each led by megalomaniacs whose behavior could only be described as demonic. These guys were acting, they're, they're just wild inside, even inside the walls of Jerusalem, factions, three factions within the Jews that were just destroying each other. For instance, the Jewish historian Josephus describes what David Chilton calls the satanic gangs of murderous zealots. The zealots were one of the factions. Remember, they're the ones that wanted to make Jesus king. That preyed on the citizens of Jerusalem while the Romans had them under siege. This is what Josephus says. With their insatiable hunger for loot, this is the, a Jewish group, within the walls of Jerusalem, the zealots, with their insatiable hunger for loot, they ransacked the houses of the wealthy, murdered the men, and violated the women for sport, raping them. They drank their spoils with blood, and from mere satiety, they, they shamelessly gave themselves up to effeminate practices, plaiting their hair and putting on women's clothes, drenching themselves with perfumes and painting their eyelids to make themselves attractive. They copied not merely the dress, but also the passions of women, devising in their excess of licentiousness unlawful pleasures in which they wallowed as in a brothel. Thus they entirely polluted the city with their foul practices. Yet, though they wore women's faces, their hands were murderous. They would approach with mincing steps, then suddenly become fighting men, and whipping out their swords from under their dyed cloaks, they would run through every passerby. This sounds like the earthly counterparts to these demons that we were reading about. The demons could not kill, but they could make their, the ones that they were tormenting to be murderous, and they certainly were. They were, it was like they were insane, the kind of behavior that was going on. And there's a lot of records about this kind of behavior that went on at this time among those who had been God's people who had professed his name. There was a deluge of demons. It is a judgment to be delivered over to Satan for destruction. Doesn't the Bible talk about that? When someone's put out of the church, we deliver them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh that they might learn not to blaspheme. In Romans 1, it says that people, when they sin against God, can be given over to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves and that they can be given over to vile passions and that they can be given over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. All of this as the penalty of their error, which was due. What was their error? Their error was rejecting God who was revealed to them. Rejecting, in the case of the Jews, the Messiah who came to them. Surely you see the parallels today in our people. Do not the words of our Lord 
in Matthew 12 leveled against Israel not apply to us in North America today. We have rejected the Lord Jesus. We have long had the privilege of having the gospel in our land and we have spurned the revelation that God has graciously given to us. We have spurned the Savior. The light has been among us for so long. Our land was largely swept free of demons when the gospel flourished, but now they are coming back like a flood and with a vengeance. Josephus sounded like a reporter in our times, describing things that we see going on increasingly among our people that we did not used to see going on. What do we see arising among our people? Mob violence, glory in murder, Women killing their babies and celebrating their freedom to do so. A delight in violence, madness, depression, anxiety, all kinds of sexual perversion. Men dressing up like women and engaging in violence. We see rape, we see pillaging, we see people who are so miserable that they want to die. We see government-sponsored suicide rampant and on the rise. We even see satanic worship and practices of the occult. Sometimes we see these things even among leaders of the people in the highest places. We are being more and more flooded with demons from the abyss in our land for the same reason that the people of Israel were flooded with demons from the abyss. Because we have rejected the revelation of the gospel that God has graciously given to us for so long. What should we then do? As God's people, we should confess the sins of our nation and plead with the Lord for mercy. We need to pray that He who has authority over these demons, which can only torment us when He releases them to do so, would send them back to the abyss. We need to pray that He would pour out His Spirit to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment and of the need, their need of Christ so that they would turn to Him for salvation and be redeemed. We need to show kindness to those who are oppressed and who are deceived by the devil and to make every effort to tell them of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose name is not destroyer, but Savior. What a contrast it is. We have a Savior Satan is a destroyer. We need to tell them that all these things are the result of our rejection of Him, this Savior, and that they are only a harbinger of greater judgment that it will come. We need to tell them that all who repent of their rebellion and look to Jesus to deliver them from sin and restore them to God will be restored. He never rejects any who come in His name to, re- to be restored to the Father. They will be, they will be, there will be eternal life and hope of glory with Him in His house of glory forever and ever. My hearers, this is all true. If you refuse to come to Jesus as Savior, you cannot be restored. You will end up at the last day in the abyss with these demons, these, this foul host of Satan and his demons. But if you will repent and believe the gospel and come to your God, you will be saved. Please stand and let's call on his name. O oh Lord, our Lord, how we praise you, Lord, for your mercy and grace to us. You have been patient with us for so long. And really, your patience is still holding out in a very strong way. We could have so much worse now than we do. We see that these things, though, are on the rise. We see that there is more and more of this kind of activity that Satan breeds, this kind of deception, this kind of corruption, this kind of vileness, this madness. And we pray, O Lord, that you would have mercy upon our land. We do not deserve it. That's why we ask for mercy. 
we have sinned against you. We have violated the gospel. You have given us the gospel light so fully. We have, we have Bibles, we have books, we have preachers, we have the truth with us for such a long time. And we are constantly rebelling and turning away from it. And we're mocking the things that have been revealed to us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us and that you would bring us to repentance. And we pray that we who know you, O oh Lord, that we would cry out to you for our land and that we would be diligent to proclaim the good news for there people can be saved in this situation. People can come to you. We see those who are oppressed with demons that came to Jesus and that came to the apostles and they were able to be delivered, not just from the demons, but they were able to be delivered from their sins that they might come and serve you and call on your name and know you and walk with you to your house, O oh Lord. And we pray that we might see the powerful working of your spirit in our land, pouring out your spirit, that people might see their sin, that they might come under conviction, that they might see the Savior, that they might turn to him. Father, we cannot do this, but you can do it. We pray that we as your agents would go forth willingly, bearing your name and, and telling people of the only way of salvation and of the doom that comes to those who refuse. Father, we thank you for the clear revelation that is in your word and even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that he spoke as well as those that he revealed to John in these visions that we are looking at. May we benefit from these things. May we apply them and may it change us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In your hands. That's our hope and our confidence, isn't it? Receive now the blessing of the Lord our God. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.